Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to what is now the 35th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us for the first time. And I see on the registration list a lot of our usual uh, attendees. So welcome back to all of you. I am just going to run quickly through these uh, introductory slides and then we're going to get straight into uh, this morning's event. Uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, uh, companies that we normally have presenting here on a weekly basis are uh, microcaps. Our definition of a microcap is anything under 300 million in market cap. Uh, the companies that present are generally in revenue and approaching cash flow break even are indeed already profitable. We don't deal with companies in the resources or the biotech sectors. So we like to say we deal with industrial microcaps, which is a bit of a catch-all term for all those other sectors from technology, media, financial services, industrial products, uh, engineering businesses, and the like. Uh, the structure of this morning's webinar, we normally have two companies. Unfortunately, our second company, uh, had to cancel last minute due to uh, being involved in a market sensitive transaction. So we will uh, hopefully get them back on at a later date. Um, it, so it's normally a 30 minute slot, which we break down into a 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes for Q&A. If you do have any questions for our presenter this morning, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. Just makes it easier to moderate the questions when we get to the Q&A section. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. Uh, where you can follow Coffee Microcaps, you can catch us on Twitter, uh, YouTube. Uh, you can subscribe there for the recording of this webinar and all our previous webinars. Uh, LinkedIn for, for some additional long form content that I do. And I also write a weekly paid newsletter where I profile one interesting ASX microcap company every week, and you can get that on the Substack newsletter platform. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Adam Cadwallader, CEO and MD of Motio Limited. So Adam, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. And if you wanna start yeah. sharing yours, yeah, it's coming through. I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Adam. Great news, Mark. Thanks very much for having me today. It's, it's actually really great to be here. I know we've attempted to do it quite a few times and uh, there's always been something in the way, but um, it's, uh, it's, great to, it's great to be here and uh, I'll, I'll hook into the presentation. Um, I guess before we begin, I just wanted to sort of say, uh, you know, when I joined in 2019, Mo Show, which was then called XCD, it pretty much lost its way. It, it had a pretty decent core asset. It was a tender-based asset, cross-track uh, digital screens on rail. But our mission was very much uh, to make a sustainable business in the outer home sector and the place-based media sector. Uh, from there, knowing that by the end of uh, financial year 21, we were going to have to have uh, replaced its revenue. More on that in a moment. Um, but we need to be kind of clear about the future. Our vision is to be the global leaders in digital place-based media and customer location intelligence. Uh, I guess we don't need to be the biggest, although that would be awesome. But uh, we need to be the company that others follow in the sector, and that's what we're focusing on. So I'm going to do this uh, looking at key audience channels that we can lead and importantly win. And uh, we've built and acquired and are, are building high-quality digital ecosystems that provide much more than just signage. So uh, I guess what I wanted to start with is a simple explanation of uh, digital place-based media for context. Um, the main differences between out of home and digital place-based environments are that it uses out of home formats such as portrait and digital displays. It's always in long dwell time environments where people are waiting or congregating in, in front of the displays for more than just a glance. Maybe it's waiting for an elevator for you know, 25 seconds or that's longer when you're waiting for your doctor, uh, which our location data tells us is about between 15 and 45 minutes. Um, it very much offers a niche audiences at scale. So all of the people in our environments are there for a purpose. 
whether it's to see a doctor or play basketball with our friends or buying petrol for your car, the audiences are specific and there's always a reason for being there. Most importantly, it aligns our commercial partners, the, I guess the places where our displays live, with an opportunity to really enhance their customer experience. Because uh, I guess these, you know, for these environments, it's much more than a transactional relationship. Um, these locations are more interested in how they can keep and communicate uh, to their customers. So we've worked on content and how it works with digital out of home and I've had you know, a great privilege to work on developing strategies for out of home companies and locations and importantly, our commercial partners. It's a very, very different proposition to traditional out of home. It's, it's got great purpose beyond advertising. Um, Look, the business is growing and, and it's a pretty great place to be right now. And since the acquisition of Adline in January last year, um, which we acquired Michael Johnson's business, um, MJ and I have been running the business very much as a true partnership. Uh, and we've both been in media sales in various roles since the early 90s. We've both spent the last 12 to 13 years specifically working in place-based environments. We know the space is incredibly well. We've made, we've made mistakes and we've had tremendous success, um, but this has included locations such as office towers, cafes, venues, gyms, airport lounges, universities, and of course, uh, health and wellbeing environments and indoor sporting and, and leisure locations. So we've grown businesses like this before for other people and companies. We love it. We're passionate about it. And um, you know, I really hope that that comes through today. So, October 2019, which was a couple of months after I joined, we this thing called the Circumflex was born. It was, it's really a clear guide on where we would play and um, importantly, how we would win. So this is what it looks like. Uh, Moshio has got three distinct areas, media or place-based ownership, creative uh, for out of home and digital place-based environments and ad tech and sport tech to develop our business to, as I keep saying, more than just advertising. Media is the main game and our digital place-based businesses is currently made up of three distinct networks, two under ownership, which are Moshio Play, which was formerly Adline that I just mentioned, uh, Moshio Health, which includes the combined health business uh, acquired from O Media last year and the recent acquisition of Swift's health and wellbeing company, uh, Medical Media. Uh, under representation, we've got the Ampol Digital Display Network, which is owned by Engages. We call this Moshio Play. Uh, these businesses are, um, you know, they've got four distinct advertising revenue streams, which I've, I've written there for you, but national revenue derived predominantly through media agencies across Australia. Uh, two, direct revenue, which is specialist brands such as smaller health or pharmacy companies, or companies looking to be more geographically specific, such as aged care. Um, and local advertising, very much hand-to-hand -hand combat, great fun, sold one centre at a time, the 12-month rolling contracts, uh, predominantly in health, but uh, increasingly in our play business, and it's going really well. Um, programmatic revenue is bought through automated exchanges. It's, it's early doors. We're seeing quality growth. But it basically means brands and agencies can, can buy our media a little bit like how you'd book a hotel or an airline ticket. So... It's, it's going, it's, as I said, early doors, but going well. Content and creative uh, sits under our enormity brand. It, its role in the world is, is to be the best in content for out of home and digital place-based environments and produce creative that works for our customers and, and commercial partners. And it's not content like you see on Channel 9. It's specifically for digital place-based environments. So it's absolutely pivotal, uh, pivotal, pivotal, in um, delivering, you know, customer experience such as uh, custom templates for medical centres, and you know, very much we've got a long-term vision, or more probably a dream at this point, uh, is to create a marketplace for digital out of home or place-based networks around the world. Uh, it's probably pretty bold, but for now, we're just ensuring that we're uh, we're the best at what we do in this sector. Our tech and sport tech is a very, you know, it's exciting, it's emerging, and it's a, becoming a really important part of our business. Um, we're currently rolling out our payments platform for players in our indoor sporting environments, which uh, MJ is driving. Uh, it's providing a seamless payment experience for players and it enhances the businesses of indoor sport and leisure environments, which is seeing the move away from the worry of uh, you know, cash 
uh, and collecting monies for teams, it's proving to be very successful. Successful, and um, it's worth around sixty million bucks. In the, that's how much money is spent in the space. So our aim is to continue to tap into that environment, and uh, we're continuing to integrate our networks into programmatic revenue streams, as I just mentioned. But um, the it's early doors, uh, but um, the results uh, the audiences and the brands are looking for. Uh, we've got them and then accessing the technology is this, this, the area that we're looking at here to connect us to the best quality revenue streams. Uh, finally, we're, we're looking seriously at how we create value for customers by adding tech and innovation uh, and location data capability, content delivery, commercial utility enhancements. Um, these are things that sort of make our business a true partner of, of each of these place-based locations we're in. Um, we're continuing to investigate acquisition opportunities and, and organic possibilities pretty much on a daily basis in this area. So a little bit on our media channels, because this is sort of, uh, as I said, the main game. Um, we refer to them internally as audience channels. So they're, they're growing, starting with health, which has been, uh, you know, overvalued, underloved, poorly run sector. It's definitely ripe for innovation and in all the elements that we thrive on. Uh, we're focused on efficient delivery of audience through these national network digital displays in these mega medical centres, large and community-based sort of point of care environments. Um, the displays are positioned in these ultra long dwell time locations, of course, uh, reaching contextual well-being focused audiences, content rich, high engagement, you know, waiting suites are sort of where our displays are located. The play network is so much fun, high energy. Again, it's a national network of digital displays with indoor sporting centers. Uh, as always, the displays are positioned in those naturally long dwell time locations where you check in, go for a drink after, meet your friends. Um, play is very much an intersection of sport, friends and community. It's, it's, I always think of it like Saturday morning every night of the week. Um, indoor sports is growing. This is cricket, netball, futsal, basketball, swimming. Uh, even inflatable playgrounds. And, and uh, as mentioned, we've got exclusive software integration, which enables payments, communication, competition management, and, and first party data provision. Um, the Motio Go network is our represented network. So it's owned by a company called Engages. It's a national network in uh, across 500 Ampol on the go retail locations. Uh, we've got exclusive representation in the in-store digital display network. We reach a massive audience with obvious and guaranteed purchase intention. Um, it's got really good quality first party data um, to help us target you know, key audience segments. But um, I guess the question that I get asked regularly is how do we consider building or buying? I wanted to include the consideration as a, a how we evaluate this. Um, I think MJ and I worked on how we, we got a, a platform around being able to make these decisions quickly. So aside of the economic considerations, which are much easier to evaluate, we look at six key test areas. So is it or can it be first party data capable? If we can't get it from point of sale systems or customer data from the locations, that's okay, as long as we have the rights and permissions to derive the data points. Um, does it have increased dwell time? So not walk by or drive by, but standby environments. Can, is it got a defined audience or activity? Um, sectors or channels we can win, so low saturation or undervalued or you know, unloved. Uh, utility at the core of the location, um, adding technology to enhance its commercial outcome for all parties. I guess the, these things allow us to assess potential targets in the place-based sector you know, rapidly and, and with extreme accuracy. So I keep mentioning that we're more than just advertising and um, whilst it's not the main game, it's bloody important because it represents more than just a check, uh, you know, for our commercial or real estate partners and, and gives us staying power in, in the environments. And I, I thought I'd talk about location intelligence. It's super important to us. Um, Mosho has four key sources of first party data among our other third party data sources that are ingested into a DMP or a data management platform uh, and then this intelligence tool. Uh, we pretty much rely on this, you know, high quality data sources to enhance our media, give life to our programmatic platforms and provide insights to commercial utility program, um, you know, but mainly to assist us in the driving of revenue across the business. It's, it's heavily weighted to first party data or, you know, transactional data, which almost always includes demography, 
Uh, it extends to presence analytics, which is um, uh, probably like Wi-Fi without the Wi-Fi sensors, which can include detailed data on gender, dwell time, engagement. Uh, and of course, uh, as I was just talking about in our play business, we have the added advantage of controlling game fixtures and customer information through a large number of indoor sporting environments. And it's all anonymized and privacy compliant because um, you know brands, they're, they don't, they're not really interested in individuals, they're interested in audiences on aggregate. So we continue to sort of look for awesome integrations that, that have customer at the center, um, such as the sports environments, uh, that's, that's more than just an ad display. Um, Utility-based content is something that's really in high demand. Um, we're, the content that becomes useful, the locations we're in, it ensures the customers or the patients, players or um, patients in our case, depending on the environment, are engaging with the displays or the screens. In our sports centres, we take online game data that I was just talking about from our software, republish it in real time through the displays in the centre. This takes it from being a sort of a dumb advertising screen to transform to a center information display. So showing game information, court numbers and results surrounded by brand advertising. So um, these pieces are also sponsorable and, and they make a huge difference to the customer experience. Uh, we integrate the online, offline and utility together. Um, you know, the locations are more than willing to pay for this service. Uh, importantly, uh, it's often required, you know, we only need one build and we can resell it multiple times. And that also keeps the price reasonable for our location partners. Uh, we also create content for network wide operators, such as large medical groups, where they might have 40 or 50 medical centers and a centralized marketing function that enables them to use the displays to cross promote their services, maybe dental or physio. Uh, again, the opportunity to build templates and uh, communication once and offer them multiple times across different centers and groups is, is probable. Uh, and this is the same for our in-centre content. Some things, that, you know, such as how you book your next appointment, what doctors are on for the day, or simple things as wash your hands are, are going to be very, you know, similar needs for one practice to, you know, whether one or 500 practices. Uh, so it's really important and the need to look professionals, gaining momentum, kind of feels like building websites in the 90s are, you know, only, only better. Um, so look, I've spoken about these areas, we derive revenue, but the core drivers of growth are, are simple for us, very important, great people, strong and deep inventory, ability to gain true, no bullshit data points, uh, and the ability to employ technology to make it scalable. I, I guess I wanted to spend a little more time on the growth drivers for our non-advertising areas, software, payments, content, and of course, uh, provide some insight as to what, how we evaluate, evaluate things from an acquisitive perspective. Um, so everything in the kind of growth or non-advertising areas is, is about kind of supporting the media core. We need to be able to do that, enhance or advance our commercial relationships with our, you know, property or real estate partners, um, deliver utility, the things that it's hard to live without that, that, are, that the commercial partners are, are happy to pay for, um, or certainly they're, they're happy to exchange um, payment you know, for in, instead of rental payments, if you like. Um, grow revenue for mutual benefit for us and, and them. And, and very much it's got to be customer centric. Um, revenue and our industry, look, just a quick overview. Uh, I've used the Outdoor Media Association 2020 published figures. Uh, it's the majority of the revenue here, but um, in 2020, but it was probably missing some key retail players that have since joined the Outdoor Media Association and, and, and us, of course, because our media business only started last July. But it's fair to say out of home took a hit last year, down 39.4%, but uh, by all accounts, it's rebounded quite well. It's worth noting that during the revenue challenges of 2020, the percentage of digital screen revenue as a percentage of total revenue actually rose slightly. So obviously um, that, that's an interesting point for us. Um, and I seriously, um, consider that this was this will continue into next year. So this is the slide that uh, you know, nobody wanted me to present today, but I'm um, quite excited about it. So this excludes our cross-track revenue. So we had a, a goal to replace the cross-track revenue by the end of uh, this financial year, which is a few days away. I'm very happy to say that we've done this. As I mentioned, we started our media business on July 1 last year for pretty much almost a standing start in the middle of COVID. 
saw strong growth each quarter. We're very pleased with the results and um, continue to see strong pipeline uh, and revenue. Um, I guess it's a great segue to talk about our FY22 goals. Um, we have five distinct and clear goals. We're targeting the doubling of the cross-track revenues, which in a normal year have been just sub $3 million entirely from our new business ventures. Uh, we want to aggressively target acquisitive growth. We want to take advantage that uh, being a public company or listed company creates. Uh, we want to derive 5% of our media revenue from programmatic or automated advertising sales. Uh, we would be needed a wanted partner of our commercial venues and our goal would be to rec be recognised by them publicly. Um, get our exciting payments, payments platform, you know, producing 100 grand in, in net revenue over the next year after costs, obviously. And these are, you know, they're, they're reasonable goals and we're pretty, pretty enthused about them as a business. Just to finish off on some key stats, um, we, I just put a little chart in here, but we've got a bit over $4 million cash in the bank. We're debt free at the moment. The market cap of 22.34 is at close yesterday. Our investor breakdown is really nice and balanced. Um, this chart you can uh, look at at your leisure. Just a few points around what potentially drove the price changes along the way since I joined in uh, August 2019. Uh, always happy to take questions, but uh, here's our contact details for future reference. And um, thank you, Mark, for having us here today. Thanks, Adam. And uh, just a quick one from me first, and then I, I know we have one or two coming through from the audience. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the 5% from programmatic and the kind of four key revenue buckets. Um, you know, over the medium term, where would you like that kind of split to be between the four buckets? Oh, that's a big question, Mark. I, I, look, I, I see a really strong mix over, you know, with a combination of machine based buying uh, in this area and you know human human capital I guess if you like uh, probably over the next five years I'd like to see you know I can see that rising even up to 50 percent so um, you know we're pretty excited about it we're very bullish about it uh, we need to uh, make sure that we're continuing to grow audiences to, to make that a possibility okay uh, question from the audience what is the unit economics in play and health and what is the commission structure average revenue per screening goal? Well, that's, uh, that's one of those questions that um, is uh, scary to answer. But look, as I said, the four revenue streams are, are pretty straightforward. Um, we've, we don't pay a lot to the centres. We, as I've said through this presentation, we either give a very small amount of net revenue to them uh, in exchange for having their screens in the location, or we exchange it for content or content plus payment. So there's a it's a really nice model. Um, the agencies, when we sell to advertising agencies, take a 10% uh, commission uh, in the market. And so the gross margin on the business is very good. So we, we always, you know, we're often looking um, to make sure that we're uh, we're deriving some really strong revenue in each of the locations at the moment, uh, it's uh, probably not the best, probably not something I really want to talk about generally. But I think you can you can do the reverse maths on how many locations we've got and the the revenue that I've just laid out for the next twelve months. Okay, great. And then acquisitions. Would any of the acquisitions you think in the next twelve eighteen months look at? expanding internationally or is it you know getting a very solid Australia base in place first and and that could include acquisitions I think we're feeling really good about our Australian base at the moment and there's some very good uh, possibilities in Australia I, we certainly wouldn't write off anything internationally particularly things that can be scaled um, probably if we were going to look internationally, we'd be looking at sort of the non-advertising areas. So, you know, uh, limit the uh, need to cross borders or be physical. Um, but that's, you know, it's certainly not off the table from our perspective. Okay, if we got any more from the audience, I'll give it a, another minute or so. 
and then maybe a, a more general uh, question uh, in terms of the, the the advertising market more broadly. Um, you know, do you think going into FY twenty two that you know brands are really ready to start engaging again post COVID and, and kind of put their put their foot foot on the gas? Is is that kind of the industry feeling or? Is everyone Very much so. a bit gun shy? No, look, I think um, certainly Australian, you know, brands in Australia, are, you know, everybody's been just, uh, I guess, chomping at the bit to, to get out there and to get revenue flowing through their marketing. Um, I, I have a very strong feeling about a, a good return to uh, pre-COVID levels over the next 12 months, certainly talking around the industry. Um, there's a real sense of optimism. So, um, and I think there's, this last 12 months has been really good. You know, we've we've enjoyed growth and um, we've, we've certainly, you know, seen the market uh, bubbling. So we're, we're very excited about it. Okay, okay. A few more questions. Um, yeah, what are your plans to make more of a success of the medical media business than under its previous ownership? Uh, it's a, that's a damn good question. Uh, I think the there's been a couple of companies in this market that have basically done a, a land grab and they haven't had any consideration for economics. They've thought they've been sitting on some sort of unicorn. Uh, they haven't had really a, an idea of, of how big the market is. And um, having, you know, MJ and I having worked in this market for a long time, you know, we've, we've got a good grasp of what, what's possible. So I think we've done a really uh, smart and, um, you know, really strong acquisition. We haven't overpaid for, for medical media. We've, we've got it at a good price. Everybody was happy with, with the, the acquisition. And, you know, we think we can, we can grow it actually profitably as opposed to just, you know, uh, trying to get as much uh, screens and land, land as possible. This is about, you know, delivering high quality audiences and making sure that they're economically viable. Um, we've just got a really, you know, we're, we're approaching it as media, as a media company, not as a health company trying to be a media company. Okay, great. And then how large, I don't know if you've done any work on this with um, MJ, but how large is the revenue opportunity domestically in your verticals? Yeah, would it be less than a hundred million, more than a hundred million? Look, I think the, the entire the the industry sector that we're operating, you know, the out of home industry sector pre COVID was a billion dollars. Um, so we're a very we're a small part of of that billion dollars, and um, we're 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 very much um, we're very we we think it's a great industry. We think it's a big sector. We've heard people talk big numbers before, particularly in the health sector. Um, you know, I think the, the, the sort of revenue that's being spent by brands in the market um, through all media that we're targeting is around sort of $100 million. Um, we are looking for a, a piece of, uh, a share of that, that $100 million that's that's in the market being spent in those sectors. Okay, great. And um, we're just actually coming up exactly on time. But I'll leave it open for another minute if anybody's got a, a final question since we haven't got a, a second presenter. So we're not going to cut into anybody else's um, presentation time. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think uh, one here, Adam, just to give some historical context, what is the cross track revenue you've talked about? So. I think somebody may be a bit new to the story here. Maybe if you could just give us a quick um, historical uh, overview there. Yeah, so the, um, the cross-track revenue pre was just shy of $3 million. Um, cross-track had, has digital screens uh, in the Brisbane and Melbourne metro train areas. So There's about 40 screens all up. They had been... Um, essentially given to JC Deco to sell over over the, the life of their business. Um, when I came into the business, it was 
made the decision was made that we wouldn't be in cross track long term and that those contracts would be up at the end of this um, financial year and our job was to replace that revenue and grow it in a sustainable way okay great um and one last one adam if you if you don't have to run um can you characterize the type of businesses you would like to acquire yeah well geez well i i pretty much uh well i think in the we, we're definitely looking for place-based businesses that, that we'd like to get into um we'd like to grow grow bigger in the ones that we're in and we'd like to look for different verticals uh in that place-based sector as i said mj and i have had a lot of experience we know where to look what to look for and importantly what we need to pay for it but it, the areas that we're really most interested in is sort of the non-advertising side that can be moved into advertising or enhance advertising or help us grow advertising so that's that's certainly um you know a, a focus for it in the technology and uh data-based platforms okay great adam we're just slightly over the half hour now so i think uh I don't think we've any more questions, so I think we'll just leave it there. Um, no worries. Thank you very much for for joining us. I'm glad we finally managed to get it together. And yeah. um, as I said, the recording of the presentation will be up on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. And with that, I will leave it there and wish everybody a good rest of their Thursday. Okay. Thanks, Mark.